Hello everyone, Hobbyist here, and we are back at it again with another board game tutorial. This time, we are going to be talking about Dead. In Dead of Winter, players are a colony of survivors trying to survive a hazardous winter in the aftermath of the zombie apocalypse. The colony has an objective they are trying to complete, but each player also controls a group of survivors that has a secret objective. Often, the secret objective requires that a player help complete the colony objective. Only players who have completed their secret objectives when the game ends will win. The game can end in a variety of different ways, and there might even be a traitor who is actively working against the colony. The first thing that needs to happen when you are setting up your Dead of Winter game is that based on the number of players that you're choosing to play with, you will hand each player a reference sheet, which will be the layout of their game. Once you have laid out your board, you're then going to either, at the collection of the group or at randomly, select one of these main mission cards, as they will be the primary scenario that you play through, and will be how you win and determines the setup for your particular game. The back of all of these cards will show the hardcore side of the main objectives. These are generally harder for the entirety of the group and are generally used for the hardcore variant or the two-player co-op experience. To keep things simple, just use the we need more samples. You're going to take the entire secret objective stack and separate it into two different piles. One's going to be just normal secret objectives, and you're going to have others that say betrayal at the bottom. You're going to take the secret objectives without the betrayal option, and you're going to take two at random for each player and then shuffle in one Betrayal card. With your stack of non-Betrayer secret objectives and Betrayer secret objectives, you are then going to shuffle the entire stack of cards and then pass one out to each player, meaning that it is very possible that there could be a Betrayer in the game or there might not be a Betrayal in the game cards right here are the crisis cards so that you are going to be attempting to resolve every single round. The next thing that you will do is that you will shuffle these and place them in the crisis cards slot. Separately, you're going to create individual stacks, one consisting of the crosswoods cards, the exile cards, and the survivor deck. As an additional side note when it comes to the crosswoods cards, the main symbol of Dead of Winter is these two cross arrows to the right. However, this blur bubble means that some of the crossroads contain mature themes, such as explicit language, drugs, alcohol, sex, suicide, a bunch of sensitive subjects. So if you're not in front of the right crowd that you think you want to be in front of, be sure to take all of these out before you start playing. In the distance down yonder, you will place all of the location mats in numerical order in whichever way you think fits best on your table. Once you have done that, you will then take the individual item deck that matches the location, shuffle them into the individual stacks, and then place them in their respective locations, face down comes to the individual playmat that you will have sitting in front of you as your reference, there are a couple of things that you want to take a look at. The first thing is that you're going to take your secret objective card and slot it face down under the secret objective slot. You can claim your secret objective to be anything that you wish, but you cannot show other players your secret objective card. While the back looks the same as the item decks that are in the individual locations, you will see these items, which have a label known as starter items. These are a completely separate deck of cards that every individual player will start off with. You will take it, shuffle it, and each player will receive five starter items. In order to get any leftover starter items that you end up not using 
will simply be removed from the game. Items that belong inside of a particular item deck will have a number and a label at the bottom here that indicates exactly where the deck is going to be coming from, and it will be able to help you deduce a couple of things that I will explain in just a second. Once you have created all of your individual decks, both for items, exiled objectives, survivor deck, the crossroad cards, and got all of the starting items as well as the cross crisis cards, the next thing that you will do is that you will simply complete the setup for the rest of the main objective. Each main objective will have its own individual setup and rules that you have to follow. We Need More Samples has these specific setup instructions. These trackers set in place. Now it is time for me to explain the Survivor Deck Draft. Before we get there, though, there's a couple of things that I need to explain with the secret objective as you're looking at it. This one is called Desire to Live. It explains to you exactly how you win the game as a survivor. If you have a card that says Betrayal on your card, that means that you are the traitor of the game. Nobody knows exactly that you might be the traitor, but as a general traitor, your goal is to directly harm the colony as secretly as possible. Your first goal is to reduce the morale track all the way to zero, causing everyone else to lose the game. Inside of Accept Your Fate here specifically, you need at least two weapon cards equipped to a survivor that you control. You also need to have three medicine cards in your hand, as starter items do not count. Objective is going to influence what survivors that you are going to want to start off with. But generally speaking, every player is going to be dealt four survivor cards each, in which you are going to be able to look at them and pick two as your starting group. Because even though every player is a part of the collective colony, each player runs their individual group of survivors that they're going to be running with. Your secret objectives for a role-playing kind of way is the secret desires or motivations that your individual group has, whether it's to the benefit or the detriment of the colony at hand. So let us take a look at a survivor card. When you receive your four survivors from the dealing, let's say that this is a selection that you were able to get from. The numbers that you're going to be looking at on the right side of the card are pretty important for the rest of the game. The number that is the biggest that is circled with the red is the influence of that particular character. Influence is a system in which it is the ranking of the characters and their role inside of the colony, but it also has a bunch of other factors inside of the rest of the game. Taking a closer look here, we could see that John Price has an influence of 18, but there's two other numbers that are right beside him. These numbers are the values in which the character is proficient at certain things. So, for example, the star-like symbol is how proficient the John Price is at his attack, meaning that he needs a action die score of 3 or greater in order to be able to attack. And it is the same with a search value. So, generally speaking, the lower their numbers are on these particular tracks, the more proficient they are at either searching, which is the magnifying glass, or attacking with this exploding symbol. Down here at the bottom is the ability in which the survivor has. Aside from reading the actual ability itself, it also tells you on the card where and when you can use the ability and whether it is passive or one-time use or things of that nature. So John Price specifically is at a non-colony location is the only time that he can use his ability. So when John is not at the colony, he is considered to have the ability of every other survivor he shares a location with. Talia Jones here, as an example, has an influence of 28, an attack value of 3 or greater, depending on your action dice, and has a search of 1 or greater. 
making her the best searching character inside of this pool. The thing that you're going to look at is that Talia Jones's ability triggers anywhere. It doesn't matter where Talia Jones is. Some characters that you find or choose to select have a an additional value that exists right beside their abilities. So as we can see here, Maria Lopez, her ability works specifically at the school and nowhere else. But this number means that whenever you are rolling your action die, you need to roll a 1 or greater in order to use this ability. Once you have decided which two survivors that you're going to select, you are then going to choose one to be your group leader and one to be your simple follower. Everybody will be deciding on what survivors that they're going to take at the same time as you will be, but any survivors that you choose not to take will get shuffled back into the survivor deck to where you might encounter them later on. Once everybody has finished picking what survivors they're going to be adding to their individual groups, they will be placing the matching standees inside of the circles of the colony occupants area. In order to determine who goes first, you are going to look at the group leaders of each individual player. Whoever has the highest influence of all of the individual group leaders will take the first player token. And the group leader token, otherwise known as the first player token, not only indicates that you will be the one who will be going first for that particular round, it also is able to influence other areas of the game. When you are the one with the first player token, any time that a vote would ever have to be called for certain situations, or any ties that happen in various situations throughout the game, you are the one who is the tiebreaker of all things. Play will then start from the group leader and move around in a clockwise fashion, going in a series of rounds. The rounds, when it comes to players, overall break down into two different phases. Starts with the player turns phase, then it goes to the colony phase. And we'll go in a series of rounds, either until the main objective has been completed, the round track reaches zero, or the colony loses. First step of the player turns phase is that you will reveal the top crisis card of the crisis deck. In order to read a crisis card to know exactly what it is that you're trying to accomplish, Here's how it works. This one is called Strength of the Dead. It says that you need to contribute these fuel can symbol cards equal to the number of non-exiled players. At the beginning of the game, no players have been exiled, so in our three-player example, we would need three fuel cans in order to pass the trial. If we fail, we remove all barricades from the colony and add ten zombies to the colony. Every crisis card that exists 98% of the time has an optional objective that where if you add bonuses or go above and beyond in preventing the crisis, then you will often gain a morale for preventing the crisis. When it comes to the roll action die step, you are going to be rolling the number of action dice determined by your current following and how many survivors you have. Because... You will roll one action die for yourself as a player and one action die for every single survivor that you have inside of your group. So, if you manage to gain more survivors, you are able to roll more action die and do more action things. If you have had survivors die off in between rounds, then this will be the step to where you remove action die to adjust for the number of survivors that are in your group. As the most forgotten mechanic inside of Dead of Winter, the player to your right is going to then draw a crossroads card and is going to be looking at a couple of things before you even take into account what you're going to do on your turn. Crossroads cards are the difficult decisions and events that you never know when they're coming. 
They can literally happen at any time during the game. It could sometimes even happen at the very beginning of the game. So you always got to be ready to resolve these. When it comes to the player holding the crossroads cards, they're going to be looking at the italicized sentence at the top as it is the trigger condition needed to happen before you resolve the rest of the crossroads card. If a crossroads card's trigger mentions something like an action, such as this one, to where it says, if the player moves a non-exiled survivor, then you only trigger the crossroads card after the action takes place. Whether you are deciding to play with the maturely themed crossroads cards or not, crossroads cards fall generally into one of three different categories. They either fall into a voting decision by the group, forced to only take one option, or that player must come to a tough decision between two options or more. When it comes to the voting's crossroads cards, oftentimes the colony or people who are at the colony will be the ones who have the options of voting. In this particular case, everyone can talk about the crossroads cards and try to collectively come up to a decision on which route that they want to take and which consequences they choose to suffer. At the same time, players will then hold out their hands, and then at the count of three, once all discussions are finished, they'll go one, two, three, and either vote for the thumbs up or down option. Majority rules does take place inside of this vote. However, in the case of ties, the group leader will always break the tie. The crossroads cards that have multiple options, other players at the table are allowed to try to influence the decision of the player resolving the crossroads cards. However, the player who triggered that crossroads cards ultimately gets to make the decision on what happens with that crossroads card. Sometimes a crossroads cards might only have one option to where you have no choice but to face the consequences of whatever it is that unfolds. In that case, you simply resolve it. If there are certain conditions on the multi-choice crossroads cards that cannot be fulfilled, then you are forced to go a specific route on the crossroads card. If the crossroads cards doesn't trigger at that given point, then you can simply place it at the bottom of the crossroads deck and not worry about it, or if the conditions needed are impossible to meet at that given time. Once the crossroads cards has been resolved, or hasn't been resolved, now it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of Dead of Winter, and that is the player turn actions. Actions inside of Dead of Winter can be done as many or as few times as you see fit on your turn. They go into one of two categories inside of Dead of Winter. Actions that require dice to use, and actions that do not require action dice to use. Every survivor can move once during their turn to any location that they see fit. All of the individual locations, such as the school and police station, are considered non-colony locations, whereas the actual occupant space and the board itself is the actual colony. Every time you move, however, whether it be to a non-colony location or to a colony location, you'll have to roll an exposure die. And if you roll a blank, nothing happens. If you roll this blood symbol, then that means that that character suffered a wound. Every character inside of Dead of Winter can handle up to three wounds. When that character receives their third wound, they will then immediately die. If you roll this symbol on the exposure die, then that means that your character suffers frostbite, which is another kind of wound. Frostbite works for the wound's threshold of each character, but works very differently. When you have Frostbite on a particular character, at the beginning of your turn, they will then suffer another wound until they eventually die or it gets healed. But if you roll this Tooth symbol, however, this is the worst result you can get, because that means that your survivor got bit and will immediately die 
action inside of Dead of Winter works as such. The character who got bit dies, but then it'll immediately spread to any nearby survivors with the lowest influence. Then, at that point, you will be able to come to two decisions if your survivor was the one who got infected. You can either stop the spread to, of that survivor and kill them off immediately, or you can take a gamble on the exposure die. Any result that isn't a blank, that survivor will immediately die and the infection will continue to spread to the next character. Meaning that if this isn't taken care of and there are multiple bad rolls, you can kill off more survivors than you would think ever possible. And this would continue to go until all survivors are dead, there's no other survivors, or if you're at the colony, it would kill all the regular survivors, and then it would kill the helpless survivors, each at a time. Every time a survivor dies in Dead of Winter, whether it be due to this infection spread, or an over-exceeding on wounds, morale always drops by one, both for these player survivors and for the helpless survivors at the colony. Cutting off the spread at the character who it spread to does reduce morale, but it makes sure that it doesn't hurt morale as quickly. However, if you roll a blank result on an infection when you are deciding to take the chance, then the infection will immediately stop and nobody else will die. Other actions that do not require action dice inside of Dead of Winter include playing a card, adding a card to the crisis, spending food tokens, request, handoff, or voting to exile. When it comes to playing cards, you have the ability to use the abilities of any of the starting items or things that you acquire over the game and play them directly to the waste pile slot. The next action that you can do without having to use any action dice at all is that you can add a card to the crisis. For as many cards that you have in your hand, you can select whichever ones you wish and place them face down in the crisis contribution to either match the symbol or if you're a traitor, you can use it to sabotage by placing the wrong symbol inside of the crisis contribution. And it could be as many or as few cards as you see fit. If you have food tokens inside of the food supply, you also have the ability as a member of the colony to spend food tokens to increase the numbers on your action die. Plus one for every food token that you spend. The next thing that you can do that doesn't require an action die is that you are allowed to make requests. On your turn, you are able to request for specific items and ask other players if they can hand them to you. If the players choose to oblige and give you the requested item, then you have to immediately use whatever item it is that you get. Some items, like this pistol here and other weapons that you might find, have the ability to be equipped to other survivors in order to be able to be carried by them. The action that I'm going to be talking about now is the handoff action, meaning that any items that you have equipped to other survivors while two survivors share a location, you are then able to, for free, hand them stuff in order for them to possess it. Any weapons that you hand off that you've already used cannot be used by that second player if it's already been used for the round. The last thing that you can do inside of Dead of Winter is that once, during your turn, you have the ability to call for a vote to exile. If you suspect that a certain player has been playing super shady and you want to kick them out of the colony, you are allowed to immediately call for this vote. Everyone at the table will then be able to discuss why that player should or shouldn't be exiled from the colony, and then everybody will come to a vote. At the count of three, with everyone sticking their hands out, will either thumbs up for yes to exile them, or thumbs down for a no to not exile them. And you are exiled in Dead of Winter, all of your survivors first immediately get kicked out of the colony occupant spaces to be placed 
anywhere in any non-colony -lo location. Next thing that will happen is that that player will then receive an exiled objective card. Exiled objectives work very differently from the normal secret objectives of Jenna Winner because they format depending on if you were the betrayer or not. If you aren't the betrayer and you get exiled, you will show that you aren't the betrayer by getting rid of your original secret objective and changing it specifically to the exiled objective by itself. Whereas if you are the betrayer and you do get caught, then generally only your first goal is going to get changed and things are going to get significantly harder for you to individually win. Colony interactions that happen inside a dinner winner do not apply to you, meaning that you cannot take a part in votes, whether it be for future exiles, whether it be for certain crossroads cards, you cannot take part of any of those votes because you're no longer part of the colony. Those effects don't apply to you. The colony also understands that because you are exiled and no longer part of that group, any time that your survivors die, morale does not drop for them. The third thing that happens is that whenever exiled players use up resources, they do not get added to the waste pile and are simply removed from the game. Plus, they also cannot contribute any cards whatsoever to the crisis, as it's no longer their concern. Certain card effects in Dead of Winter might give you the opportunity to add survivors to your following. When this happens, if you are part of the colony still, it will take up the colony occupant slot. You can do this as many times as you see fit until all the slots are used up. If you are exiled, however, the survivors will then instead go to non-colony locations. Last and most important thing when it comes to deciding whether you want to exile a certain player or not is that if two players get exiled through votes and neither one of them were in fact the traitor, then morale immediately drops to zero and causes the game to end. So you Exile players cannot also interact with the food supply when it comes to spending food tokens, but they can use their own food cards in order to use the same effects as what the food supply token would do. Get that out of the way, now it is time for us to look at the layout of certain things when it comes to the actual locations, because we're going to be talking about all of the actions that do require dice that are going to be helpful to individually as secret objectives or being exiled is concerned or to the benefits of the actual colony. To account the attack values and abilities of the survivors that you control, you have the ability to attack either other zombies or other survivors at the same location as you are. So if it is at the colony, you have to be in the colony occupant space in order to be able to attack zombies that are trying to get in. Or you have to be at a specific location in order to attack zombies that are there. To resolve any actions that require action die, you're going to move the die of the matching numerical value or greater over to the used action dice pool. And then what you are simply going to do resolving that attack is that if it is an attack against the zombie, you are then going to remove it from the space you are attacking it from and are simply going to roll for exposure and match the results as mentioned earlier. Attacking a survivor in Dead of Winter works very differently than attacking a regular zombie. Taking into account the attack scores of both characters involved, you are then going to spend an action die to perform the attack, matching the numerical value in order to do so, and then you will roll that spent action die. If that die matches or exceeds the attack score of the person you are attacking, then you are able to inflict one wound onto that survivor and take a random item card from that player's hand. Otherwise, nothing happens. Whenever you are performing attacks in Dena Winner, you can attack with the same survivor as many times as you have the action dice to do so. 
When you decide to attack another survivor, you do not have to roll the exposure die, regardless on whether the attack hits or not. Searching is the next action that's going to require an action die in order for you to be able to use. And there are a couple of things that you want to keep in mind when it comes to searching based on the location that you are at. From the slot on the map where the actual deck for the items go, one of the key things that you're going to want to look at is up top. All the symbols that you see on the card itself are the symbols that you can find for item types inside of that particular deck. Going from left to right indicates the likelihood of being able to pull that particular item. So for example, it is easier to pull food from the school location as it is with the grocery store, but the next most common items are different between the school and the grocery store as medicine is easier to find on the grocery store in comparison to the almost last medicine place at the school. However, survivors themselves are both difficult to find in general, and it is physically impossible to find weapons at the school. So you gotta take that in mind. If you move the action die appropriate to the search value, you will take the top card of that particular item deck in order to look at and keep. If you decide that you want to look at more cards or aren't satisfied with what you drew, you are allowed to place what is called a noise token at that particular location in order to draw and look at more cards. Placing as many noise tokens as you have slots at that particular location to look at more cards. But ultimately, with the exception of certain survivor abilities, you're only ever able to keep one card of your choice. In which that gets added to your hand and the other gets shuffled back into the item deck. Barricade is another action that you're able to use action dice to do if you think your values aren't worth it when it comes to your character abilities. Because when it comes to barricading, you can use any numerical value on the barricades and just simply take a barricade token that looks like this and place it on any of the spaces where zombies can be placed. Waste allows you to use an action die of any value to remove three cards from the waste pile from the game. Shifting zombies allows you to use an action die of any result and move two zombies that are at your current location to any other location where a survivor is located. Once you have used up your action die to either do any of these actions, use any survivor abilities that pertain to these numerical values, and done as many actions that don't require any action dice as you want, you can then officially end your turn, and then the next player will do the same thing on their turn, contributing cards to crisis, so on and so forth. When it comes to the colony phase order, it starts like such. You pay food needed to feed everyone inside of the colony. This includes helpless survivors, who do absolutely nothing but consume food, to the actual survivors that your players control. The ratio in which food needs to be paid is that you use one food token for every two survivors, and it always rounds up if you had an odd number. And simply return the three food tokens to the supply you don't have enough food, however, then you are going to add another kind of token known as starvation tokens. Whenever you add a starvation token to the food supply, you do not remove any other tokens that you already have inside of the food supply. And what simply happens is that you drop a morale for every single starvation token that you add to the food supply, meaning that they will stack and accumulate until morale hits zero so long as you don't have enough food to feed people is the check waste simply meaning that you go to the waste pile and you count the amount of cards that are inside of the waste pile for every 10 cards that you find you are going to then reduce morale by one the next thing that's going to happen is that you're going to then resolve the crisis all cards that were contributed to the crisis will be immediately shuffled so you won't know who gave what and will be slowly revealed one at a time Every card that counts towards the crisis will count as one point. 
Every card that symbol doesn't match to the crisis symbol counts as minus one point towards the progress of the crisis. If the number that you have matches the crisis, then the crisis has been averted and everyone has successfully made it through. Otherwise, though, if the number doesn't meet it, either by physically not enough cards or enough sabotage has happened, then you will resolve the fail condition inside of the crisis card. All waste that was counted for that lost morale will stay inside of the waste pile from round to round, but all cards that were contributed to the crisis will be removed from the game. If at any point during Dead of Winter when you are doing the pay food step you have a surplus of food rather than a shortage, then your food will also carry over from round to round. The next step of the colony phase is to add zombies. The way that this works is that you will start at the colony first before you go to the non-colony locations. When it comes to the colony, you are going to count the number of survivors that are inside of the colony and the ratio works as such. You will add one zombie for every two survivors that are inside of your colony, counting both your helpless and the survivors that players control. Inside of this particular example here, we can see that we have six helpless survivors and one regular survivor that a player controls, meaning that we will add four zombies to these entrance spaces as such. Each of the entrances on the colony board are labeled one through six, and instead of filling them up one at a time, you are going to go in a manner that distributes evenly across the board. So the four zombies that we add here will start at number one, go to number two, then number three, so on and so forth, clockwise all the way around for each zombie that you add. If a location needs to add a zombie, but you have a barricade in the slot of where it would go, simply remove the barricade and don't add the zombie. At every non-colony location, however, you will add a zombie for every survivor that is at that non-colony location. The next thing that you will take a look at after you have added these zombies to the non-colony location is the amount of noise tokens that are at a location. For every noise token that you have, you are going to roll a not used action die to determine if a zombie was attracted to the extra noise. On a result of three or less at a non-colony location, another zombie will be added, taking into account whether barricades were put at that location or not. If a location, whether it be at the colony or not at the colony, needs to add another zombie but there is not enough space to put them there, then that area is considered overrun. And it works differently at both locations. If the overrun takes place at the colony itself, then the survivor with the lowest influence will die, but if there are no survivors at the colony, when the colony becomes overrun, you will kill off a helpless survivor instead, remembering to drop morale for each survivor or helpless survivor that dies in this process. However, this is not an infection. Once the zombies have been added both to the colony and the non-colony locations, taking into account the barricades and noise, the next step that will be happening is that you will then check the main objective. You're going to check and see if at that point during the game that the main objective's victory condition has been met. If so, regardless of where we are on the round track, the game will then immediately end. The next step will then to be move the round track down another round, indicating the countdown for the rest of the game, to where if the round track also reaches zero, then the game will immediately end, regardless of where we are looking on the morale track. The last step that will happen inside of the colony phase is that the first player token will be passed to the right instead of to the left. 
where play will then start back over at the player turns phase, going clockwise, and you go through it all over again. In Dead of Winter, the game ends in three ways. When the round track hits zero, when morale hits zero, or the moment that the main objective gets completed. If the main objective does get completed, then every single player will reveal their secret objective cards to determine who in fact won the game. If you failed to complete your secret objective by the end of the game, then you did not win the game. But each individual player who did, does win the game. So there can be as many winners or losers as possible. Ultimately, this game is one that takes a couple rounds to getting used to. Once you get through your first player turns phase and colony phase, maybe your second one, things will start moving like a well-oiled machine. But otherwise, I thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next video.